everybody! So I am hoping everything is working well today as I am running a little late so I had to bike over here as quickly as possible and I didn't have time to do a tech check first. Um, for those of you who don't know, I have a super private group where I bop over and do my little technological experimentation to make sure everything's working smoothly. So please let me know that you can see me and hear me because that would be great. Anyway, hello Frankie. Hello, I see the usual suspects checking in. It's so lovely to see you all. Hi, happy Saturday everybody. Uh, or if you're tuning in from Australia or New Zealand, happy Sunday. <laughs> great. So I have a plan today very exciting. Uh, and the plan is that I am going to talk to you a little bit, first off, about what the publication process is like. So here is the thing. Uh, I uh, was have been I was talking on a recent uh, reveal about an arc, which is this. That is what an arc looks like. Or at least in this instance, that's what an art looks like. And I realized that not a lot of sort of chronic readers and people who are not already in the publishing industry necessarily know what ARC means, A-R-C. So I thought I ought to tell you guys what it means. And then I thought, you know what? What I really wanted to do was tell you what the book production side of being an author is like from my perspective as an established author um, and it, within the traditional publishing kind of sphere. So I'm hoping that you guys are interested in that and I'm gonna start off the live that way and there will absolutely be time to take your questions later so we'll we'll definitely get to that. Um, but I thought I would start it that way and that and then um, People who wanted to tune in and just see this part, just see me talk about the industry, could do that, um, and then they can leave <laughs> when they're, if they're, in case they're not interested in the second bit. So let's talk about what happens when you are an established author and you're writing, say, a book like this to a known audience, like fan service, or a book that is the next book in a series, for example. So here's how it is from my perspective. So generally speaking, when you sign a contract with a publishing house, one of the things that's part of that contract is something called an option clause. Now, your option clause can be broad, which is bad, or it can be tight or narrow, which is good. And by that I mean, the option clause is merely the right of forced refusal. So if your book does well, generally that's what, <laughs> that's what the publisher wants. If your book does well, then they can activate their option clause, which means when you write another book, they have the right to publish it first. And they still have to offer you money for it and all those sorts of things. And, and this is key, you as the author can say no and can take that book elsewhere and maybe offer it to a different publishing house, but then your publisher who has the option clause has the right to give you more money to publish it themselves. So that's what the option clause basically is kind of a, um, a way for the publisher to ensure that they get to keep publishing you if you've done well for them and they've done well for you. So that's what the option clause is. Now, uh, open option clause is essentially something like we get to but we get the option on any book that Gail Carriger writes, period. Doesn't matter whether it's a children's book, whether it's a, a nonfiction book, and even if we are a fiction house, we still want the right. Now that obviously is an option clause that's very bad for the author, because if a publisher isn't good at, for example, publishing nonfiction, then you really don't want them publishing your nonfiction for you, right? It's not their thing, they don't know how to market it. Um, so what you want as an author is something called tight option clause, which essentially, thank you, Dick, Dick has published this over, so yay, uh, sorry. So what you want as an author is a tight option clause, which essentially says something like, we have the right to publish the next Gail Carriger book that is alternate history, that is novel length, uh, and that has fantasy elements. 
So that's a great option clause, essentially. It means that um, that publishing house, so if I write a young adult book, even if it's alternate history and it's fantasy, I can take it to a different publisher. That's um, if I write a novella, for example, I can publish it myself or take it to a different publisher. I don't even have to offer it to my existing publishing house. So that's the option clause. And the way we authors talk about this, and this is where it's pertinent to you, my darling readers, um, is we will discuss our option clause as they didn't activate the option or I'm under contract or I'm under option which means I have to offer it to this house. Uh, they didn't activate the option as kind of code for that first book that I sold to them didn't sell well enough, so they're really just not interested in another book for, for me. Or I wrote another book, but it was, say, science fiction instead of fantasy, and even though they had the option on that genre, they weren't interested in, in science fiction from me. They're only interested in fantasy, or what have you. So, when you are traditionally published, at least partly, which I am partly, some of my books I self-publish, some of my books I traditionally publish, which is why I call myself a hybrid author, you, um, you have this option clause in place, and often the most common use of that is for a series. So, I wrote Soulless, and my publisher Orbit had the option to get another book from me, and they wanted another book in that series, which is why I wrote Changeless, etc. So that is how a series comes to be. By the time I had finished the Parasol Protectorate series, Orbit still had the option on another book from me, which is how I wrote Prudence and started a new series. So it was part of the option clause that was part of my contract for Timeless. So, so it can jump you from one series to another series in option clause class. So I will then write the book. And here is where we get to the book publication process. So I will then write the book, and that's the part that's like the brutal hard bit, right? Um, and then uh, I will submit the book. So uh, backtracking very slightly, one of the other things to know about the way publishing works with traditional publishers is you're paid three times. And the first time you're paid is when you sign the contract for a book. Um, and that can happen whether you've written a book or not, depending on how established you are as an author. Um, and so I've signed a contract for a new book. I have written, and I got, I got a third of what I would be paid for that book at that time. Then I write the book. Then <laughs> I submit the book. So, right. So that's that bit. <laughs> that's the easy part, right? So that's called delivery. So I have delivered the manuscript and it is delivered to my editor. Then the editor decides whether they accept the manuscript at that juncture. So sometimes the manuscript is completely not what they thought they were going to contract you for. Uh, like I said I was going to write one plot and I wrote something completely different. Or I said I was going to write a fantasy and I just wasn't inspired so I wrote a science fiction instead. So in other words, the, the book that I actually handed in doesn't satisfy the option clause um, or it wasn't what they were expecting. So they can actually reject the book at that juncture. Um, but usually they don't. Usually they accept the book. And then I am paid another third of what I'm owed for that book. So now I have two thirds. And that's called, authors will call this, and, and most people in industry will call this, delivery and acceptance. So it's been delivered, it's been accepted. That doesn't mean that the book doesn't need work. Then, so at that juncture, you then get your editor to do revisions. And this is where um, the language between self-publishing and traditional publishing is very different. When traditional authors who are published through traditional publisher talk about their editors, that's because they have a very different relationship with their editors than self-published authors do. My editor at my publishing house is my advocate. So she's going to um, publicity meetings for me. She is my project manager. She's going to guide this book through every step of its birthing process. So it's a very different relationship. However, what she does do, at least first up, or, or he, it's, it's usually a she in my case, <laughs> um, is she does do a developmental edit. In traditional publishing, this is just called the edit pass. Some authors will call this the revision pass, so the language is very complicated. When an independent author or a self-published author hires an editor to do something called a dev edit, that's a developmental edit. That is the same thing that the traditional editor does at this juncture. This edit or developmental edit is kind of like concept and voice and character and world building. 
It's not typos. It's not grammar. It's um, whether the story is good. How's the storytelling? That's what a developmental editor does. Or if you're a traditional author, it's just what your editor does. So when authors are talking about having an edit pass or a dev pass or a revision pass, that's this stage. So you've turned in your rough draft or whatever draft it is that you thought was good enough to go to your editor. And then you get it back and you do this like big heavy pass. And for some of us, it's going to be a huge, for some books, it's a huge thing. Um, and sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes the editor is like, no, this is actually really good. There are a couple of scenes that I feel, you know, like maybe are a little too much info dump, you know. I mean, sometimes a dev editor will put a note in your margin that just says, this scene isn't working for me. And it's up to you, the author, to figure out why, <laughs> right? Some editors, and I'm looking at you, my darling Sue, I don't think she's tuning in, but Sue is my dev editor who I hire to help me with my novellas, will say, put in more sex <laughs> or... <laughs> So, um, for those of you who have questions about this process, hold them until the end and we'll do a little Q&A that's specifically about the publication process. So that's delivery, acceptance, and then developmental edits. And then, of course, after your editor has edited this, they give it back to you. Usually when you get it back from your dev editor, there's like a, a couple of pages full of notes of like big pass things, world building things or whatever. And then there's also like margin comments and a lot of scene by scene notes. In this day and age, that is almost always done digitally. And that's why you'll see this girl complaining brutally about having to move to Word, the, the program Word, at this juncture. Because I don't write in Word, but really the best way to do these kind of track changes back and forth in commentary. And the only way that New York Publishing really still does it is with Word documents. So that's when I start to freak out because my Word program keeps crashing and stuff like that. But that's a whole other story. So that's our, our revisions. At this juncture, if you're a traditional author, you then go, you have a certain amount of time, a rest usually a restricted amount of time, if you're lucky it's something like two weeks, if you're really lucky it's like three weeks or a month, to turn it around, and that's the term we use, so have a turnaround time of X, and give that now edited document back to your editor. If you are a hybrid author, it depends on your relationship with your dev editor, so if you're, you're self-published, it depends on your relationship. Sometimes you will hand it back to them, but most often that's it. They've done their dev edit pass, you get the book back, you're responsible for the next stage. But if you're working with a traditional publisher, there can be ser a series of back and forths over a book. Um, you know, series of revision passes. Me, after, you know, 25 books, it's not like that for me anymore. I just usually do my dev edit. It's usually perfectly fine and acceptable. I turn it back in, and that is when, in traditional publishing, your book goes into production. Uh -huh. And that means, essentially, it goes out of the editor's hands and on to contract workers. So your publishing house contracts with a series of copy editors. Sometimes you get the same copy editor. They have contracted with one publishing house. They work with them. Somehow, sometimes it's an in-house copy editor. They, they actually work in with that publisher as an employee, usually as a subcontractor. So then your book is sent out to your copy editor. Now, how is a copy editor different from a dev mental editor? Okay, a copy editor is looking at those other things. They are looking at grammar, spelling, um, typos. They'll anglicize sometimes if you're changing from one uh, style of English to another. That's what your copy editor is doing for you. They are vital. They're super, super important for all of us. They're also looking for double word use. So you use one word too many times in a paragraph. Things like they're looking for repeat phrasing. Um, if you are having dialogue and your characters say the same thing in a couple of different ways, like that is the kind of thing a copy editor looks for. So they're very necessary in this process, trust me. Um, sometimes they're hilarious and most of the time they don't have a sense of humor, but that's okay. <laughs> so that's your copy editor. Um, so they get it. And then uh, you're liaising with your regular editor. If you're self-publishing, you've sent it off to a copy editor who you've contracted separately. 
Uh, and then you get it back. And then once again, you have a turnaround time from an author. So then another couple of weeks usually. And so you're going to go through and look at every single edit, every single comma that's been taken out, comma that's put back in again. There's a whole language for this. There's something called a style sheet. So some authors are very uh, precious about certain things. For me, it's the Oxford comma. So I have a personal style sheet that I send out to my copy editors that basically says, do not use the Oxford comma. Never put colons or semicolons into my dialogue. I just don't, like I just have weird quirks like that. So you, the author, are allowed to have grammatical rules in place, um, but you do need to sort of state them up front. So it's a good thing if you know that about yourself. Like I really love to use fragment sentences. I also like to start my sentences with the word and, and I know that for most copy editors, they don't like that, but I like it and, I, and I'm aware that I do it. And so in my style sheet, it basically says, Gail's allowed to do these things. <laughs> like, don't get hives, dear copy editor, <laughs> over the fact that Gail likes a fragment sentence here or there. Um, and generally speaking, you have a good relationship with a copy editor who does that for you. Um, some, so there are copy editors who specialize in different genres. So you want, if you're writing his, something with historical connotation, you probably want a copy editor who's comfortable with that. If you're writing sci-fi, same thing. Um, and so then, then, then the copy edit comes back, you turn that around, <laughs> then you turn it, give it back to your editor again, and then it goes off and it goes into the production thing. Now, this is where um, things get very different uh, between traditional and um, self. Not many self-published authors do a proof pass edit. You should, you should, you should contract out, but it is expensive, um, but most traditional publishers do. So a proof pass is when the publisher takes your book and lays it out exactly how it would look in print, how it would appear on the page. And it wasn't until very recently that the proof pass was digital as well. Usually a proof pass uh, used to be just mailed to you in, in bulk, but you would get these pieces of paper with the book laid out as if it were a page of the book, exactly how it would look in print. Then you have to go through and double check. <laughs> <laughs> this is the hardest part. For me, this is the harder part of the process because there's no flags in of things that have been done at this juncture. Now you have to go in and basically just reread the entire book and hope that you catch if they laid it out wrong, if they missed a paragraph, if they dropped a whole sentence somewhere. Uh, and, and then, and, and during the proof pass from a traditional uh, perspective, you can only change up to 10% of the book. So this is not a point at which you can do a major revision at all. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can only do subtle changes. And that's because they don't want the words to move on the page too much. It's been set. It's been typeset. Then, <laughs> so you do your proof pass. Often for me, this is when I do an audio pass. I, I like to like speak the whole book out loud and kind of listen to it if I have time. Then the proof is turned in and then uh, it goes like proceeds during the production. But if you're a traditionally published author, that's when like your end of the business ends. Like, so for us, that's like the big relief moment. I've turned my proof pass in. Nothing else is going to come onto my plate until the book actually hits the world. Uh, for self-published, of course, then you have to go through the process of uploading the book, formatting it, and all those sorts of things. It's a different kettle of fish. But we're talking specifically trad here. Now, <laughs> Uh, again, if you have questions, I'm going to, I will totally tell you, like at the end of this, I'll be like, ask your questions now. And I will look at the comments and I will, I will start answering those questions. We're almost done. If you are, um, with specific kinds of publishing houses, so young adult publisher, publishers, um, some science fiction, some fantasy. And if you have a book that they think is going to be like pretty critically popular, um, and generally speaking, you can sort of tell by how much money they spent on you. So if you have a larger advance, if they've given you a little bit more money for this book than the average, they're probably going to do something called print an arc. And this is where we come to this, an arc. So an ARC or an ARC, ARC is an advanced review copy. It's also sometimes called an advanced reader copy. It's also sometimes called an advanced uncorrected proof. Basically, this book is a bound book. In the, in the old days, sometimes it was like ring bound and stuff. 
And this is what is sent out to traditional reviewers, like Publishers Weekly or Kirkus, or back in the days and then like Romantic Times, um, Locus Publications, for example. You send one of these, and because those review magazines have such a long lead time, because they then need to send this book out to their reviewers who need to have time to read it and time to review it. That's why something like this and this book we're talking in April. This book does not come out until October. But that's why it has such a long lead time. Because they, the publisher, wants to give the reviewer companies time to send these things out and get them read. Now this is obviously an old-fashioned model because it's based on actual physical print copies. But it's still a model that's in place. And that's why ARCs are made. Now you will see ARCs come up quite a bit. They'll pop up on Goodreads, people will do giveaways of ARCs. They're never supposed to be resold, so um, there's like a, a contingency in place for that. Like you're, you're never supposed to get and then sell an ARC. Um, and then of course you can see how books that are like super super screamingly popular they won't do ARCs for because it's too dangerous. Like the latter Harry Potter books for example, because um, there's too much demand for them and the black market would be too high so they're just like gonna circumvent that and not do an arc at all they're just gonna keep a really tight hold on it uh, but for something like this they're gonna send it out now this is the same kind of size and print and layout as the book will be in its finished form but obviously it's not the finished form I don't have the finished form of this yet because not on in October, but I have the finished form of another book from the same publisher and that's this. So this book will eventually look l like this book, which is a hardcover um, and which obviously it doesn't have the back on it or anything. Now this has like the back description on it and of often an arc will also have sort of marketing information on it and stuff on the back for the purposes of the media who's using it. Um, right, so Solus from Subterranean is a reprint so they never did an arc of it because Solus had already had arcs a decade ago uh, but that's what the finished product will then sort of look like. And so, uh, yeah, so they send the arcs out and then eventually the book comes out and the end of the story is when the book itself comes out in publication, that's when us authors are paid the last one third of our advance. <laughs> so we are paid three times. The first time is on delivery, uh, the, sorry, the first time is on signing, signing the contract. The second time is on delivery and acceptance. And the third time is on publication. So those are the three times you're paid for, for your work when you're a traditionally published author. And that is the road to publication <laughs> for, a, for a traditional author. Thank you for joining Storytime with Gail Carragher. I will now entertain your questions. <laughs> Um, before we uh, go on though, just for, for fans who have been very patient and have tuned in for this, um, there have been some questions on the group as to the difference uh, when, with this book, which is coming in October. So there are, is a numbered series of books that look like th they're going to look like this. There are uh, 500 of these printed. That's it. That's, that's all that are going to be printed of this book in this form. Those 500 um, are numbered 1 to 500. So you will literally know which number you have in the order printed if you've pre-ordered one of those books. Then there are, I think, 26 lettered editions. There's been some question in the Parasol Protectorate group of what a lettered edition looks like. I am now going to show you a lettered edition. This is Solus's lettered edition. You can see it is actually in a special box that is designed specifically to hold this book. And then the lettered edition is a special version of that book with this special uh, super fancy gilt. And then instead of, um, instead of a number on the signing page, this book will have a letter. So that is literally what a lettered edition means. <laughs> so those, uh, uh, so that answers that question I've been having a little bit. So why don't we take a look at the time? 
So that took us, <laughs> took me a little longer than I had thought. That took me about a half an hour. Why don't I take 15 minutes to answer any questions you have about the traditional publishing process and then we'll finish with a standard Q&A, anything you guys want to ask me. So, <laughs> Ty is saying, Professor Gale, I would listen to one of your lectures again. Thank you very much, Ty. I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm seeing Angela's comment that says, love it. So that's the last comment I see. If you guys have questions about the traditional publishing process, you can go ahead and ask them now. Eileen wants to know if I receive a number one in every edition uh, that I have. Uh, no. So as you can see, all uh, an author, uh, especially traditionally published author, gets books given to them by their publisher. These are part of the contract. So when I sign a contract with Orbit for a Parasol Protectorate book, for example, I get a certain number of copies just shipped to me automatically as part of my contract when that book comes out. Um, and those are copies for me to use at my discretion. So I could resell them if I wanted to. Usually what I do is give them away to like the cheer up members, right? You guys are always getting free books because I have a lot of free books lying around that I would love to give away to you. Um, so, and the same thing happened with Subterranean. So when Subterranean did this version of Soulless, I got, I think I got like 30 copies of it. Um, don't get too excited. I've given most of them away. My copies, because they're not part of the actual run, are not lettered. So instead, my, my copies, they're not numbered or lettered. They say PC. That's publisher copy. Um, that just means it's not part of the official kind of print run process. All right. Stop asking questions for a moment, please. And I'm scrolling through to... Um, Marissa says, for my books, is there usually a huge difference between the ARC and the final product? What a good question, Marissa. So with Solace, the Parasol Protectorate books, the ARCs looked almost exactly like the finished product. And that's because Solace came out as a mass market paperback and the ARCs were a mass market paperback. So they looked really, really similar. It's hard to tell the difference. The only difference is that on the ARCs, um, sometimes the paper quality isn't as good and often there'll be like a big uh, statement like that or a huge badge on it that basically says not for resale ARC. Um, uh, this is an example of with self-publishing what it looks like. So you got this like thing across the cover that says not for resale because it's, 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 a, it's a proof copy or, or an ARC. Um, with the uh, Custard Protocol books or any of my books that come out in hardcover first in the United States, those are going to look like this one does. So the ARC will be paperback even though the book is actually releasing in hardcover. So there were ARCs or ARCs of the first two books in the Custard Protocol series, but there weren't for the last two books in the series. That is actually not uncommon. Um, if they're gonna do an ARC for a series, they will always do it for the first one. They will sometimes do it for the second one, and then after that it's actually really rare for any advanced re review copies to happen for subsequent books in series. And that's just because the publisher knows that people get vested by being, by reading the first books in series. After that, you're always gonna, or you're usually gonna lose sales because people don't usually like stick with series. So there's not as much point in going through the hassle of printing an ARC at that juncture. So the difference is, uh, in short, that um, if the book is coming out in mass market paperback, there's usually not that big of a difference. If the book is coming out in trade paperback, there's usually that not that big of a difference. If the book is coming out in hardback, the ARC is almost always actually a trade paperback instead. It's cheaper to ship and it's cheaper to print. So there you go. Book says, when I read through out loud, do I read in different voices? <laughs> what a cute, sometimes. Um, back in the old days, I would do a different voice for Ivy's dialogue when I was reading the Parasol Protectorate books out loud, but she was the only one. For some reason, Ivy had like a very distinct kind of lispy voice in my head. So I would just do that for my own entertainment. But no, actually, I'm a, I'm a pretty monotone reader when I'm doing it. 
Um, and you, so like if you were to sort of pass my office in the hall and hear me on a read pass, it goes and then when I get annoyed at myself, I go <laughs> that's what you would hear. Um, yeah, I'm not a great reader. I know you guys really want me to do some like I'll maybe do a live where I read something out loud, but I just don't I'm just not really an actor. So it's not really my skill set to do like different voices and stuff. I just don't think I'm really good at it. Um, yeah, I just, I just do an audio pass because I catch more when I'm listening to things. I, I recommend to all authors, especially newer authors, that you do a pass where you read at least large chunks of your book out loud. You really do um, use a different part of your brain when you're doing that and you catch really different things. Uh, Courtney says, wondering how you get started if you haven't been published before. Um, so Courtney, I think it, I, I don't see the rest of your question. So just a reminder to everybody, if you ask a question, make it as short as possible, because I can only read uh, three lines of text at once on a Facebook Live on a mobile device. And if I click to read more of a comment, it, it actually messes up the recording. So I can't do that. So you have to make your, your question nice and short, please. Um, but if you're asking for advice on how to get published, I'm not a great person to give that advice now because uh, my first book came out a decade ago and everything has changed so much. Um, there are lots of resources out there for you, though, um, including on my website. I have a resources tab on my website, and there's a whole section that's for specifically for beginning authors. If you want to know whether I think you should attempt to be traditionally published or publish yourself, if you're starting out right now, that really depends on what genre you're writing, your personality as an author, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it's a very complicated and usually a very personality specific answer, I'm afraid, to that question. But if you run into me at a convention sometime, buy me a drink. Ooh, drink. Um, I actually have a drink. <laughs> and um, and I will, I will try to help you out with that. Uh, but I'm really just not the best person to give beginning author advice now because uh, it's changed so much just in the time that I've been writing. And um, I just don't know what it's like to be a beginning author now. Uh, but but honestly, whether you choose to go traditional or not uh, largely depends on your genre these days. Um, so that's a whole other discussion. Angela is asking about rereading my copy for errors. Is it difficult when you're so close to the work? That is an excellent, excellent question. Um, one of the things that I often advise authors who are working through a revision, and, and I do believe that you um, you write your rough draft, you should revise it and you probably are going to have to revise a manuscript several times before you even give it to anybody else, before you give it to beta readers, before you give it to a critique group. Um, I'm, a, I'm a real believer in, in learning how to revise yourself and learning how to turn off one half of the brain and turn on the critical side of the brain, um, it, although it, it can be very difficult. But you're right. Um, I am very close to the work and I know how the sentences are supposed to be. So it's really hard for me to catch errors because I just don't, I don't see them. Um, it's really hard for me to catch them because I just, I just don't see them. So um, aside from doing an audio pass, another thing that I will do is change the font. So if I'm working in a, in a serif font like Times New Roman, uh, I will change it to a sans serif font, which I might not like but it changes the way the words look on the page and I catch more errors that way. Another thing with a revision pass that I will do um, is sit. Not everybody has this luxury, but the single best thing that I do as a writer is write something and then leave it alone for at least a month. Two or three months is ideal. More than that is even more ideal. And I think that's the, and go write something else. Go read something else, go, if you don't want to write more fiction, go write some nonfiction. Just just do something else. Because just time and space and forgetting what you wrote actually helps you more than anything else on doing that revision. Um, so I always feel really lucky when I have what I call a book sleeping or a book on the back burner. So right, I've written the um, I've written a rough draft of the next Delightfully Deadly book. But I don't have time to revise it right now, and I don't have an opening in my production schedule to push it out, even if I did. So by force, it has to wait. But I'm actually, I know you guys aren't happy, but I'm really happy about that, because I know it's going to be a better book for, that, for having waited. Because I'll have forgotten about it, and then I can come back to it. And you know what the real joy is? 
you actually realize that you're okay, that you're an okay author. I think so many of us authors are so self-critical. But if I have some distance from a book and I can come back to it, it's almost like reading someone else's book. And, and you'll hear me like chuckle at myself or I'll be like, oh, actually, this is pretty good. Or did I write that? Oh, oh, look at me put a sentence together. You know, um, it's really nice to have some time and distance from your book. So um, yeah, if you can do it, uh, just putting it aside for a while is, is really the best thing f to get that separation. Um, if your question is uh, being close to the work and therefore struggling with uh, other people telling me what to change in terms of a developmental edit or even a copy edit, yes, that can be a struggle, but I am not precious about my books. I never have been. There are things that I will just fight tooth and nail for. Uh, but fortunately, they just tend to be things that uh, my publisher or my editors have never, never really cared <laughs> to, to change. So that's fine. I haven't had to fight for them. Um, I just don't like, generally speaking, one of the things that, so I have a number of uh, beta readers as well who help me out in making sure I'm in world consistent. I also have a couple of people I call my alpha readers um, and they read very early on in the process. A, sort of like a developmental editor to kind of tell me how the voice feels and whether they like the characters and whether it's funny. That's really all I'm asking from them. Um, and I, I, I like it. I, I, I'm always, I've always been one of those author, authors who really likes to be edited. Um, I want it to be a good book. I want it to be as perfect as it can be. And that means getting readers input, um, getting trained readers to tell me, you know, how they feel about this book, whether it's working for them, what they're upset about, all that sort of thing. Um, and sometimes uh, they are picking up on something and the error is actually somewhere else. And this has just been a learning process for me as an author to learn what the editor means. Sometimes an editor will offer a fix and I'll be like, I can see there's something wrong, but that like some wiggy thing in my brain is telling me that that's not the right fix, but I will figure it out. <laughs> um, um, and that's the hardest part of the edit process is like figuring out like what the right correction is. But for me, none of that comes from being precious about those words. Um, and one of the ways to get around that, if you are precious about your words, is to tell yourself that you can cut it out. If it's not working, you can cut it out, but that doesn't mean it's deleted. You can save it in the side, you can use it as a blog post later, you can send it out to your newsletter as an extra special bit. If you're like really delighted with a description or a scene or something, you can use it in another book later, something like that. Um, just because you need to cut it doesn't mean it's gone, but it will make for a better book later. I always think about books as a little bit like cooking a stew or something. Like you need people to taste test it for you and sort of tell you, oh, that needs a little bit more salt or what have you. Um, but you also can't have everything in it. Like the best stew is actually relatively simple. You can't just keep throwing <laughs> every meat in there. You know, you can't keep throwing every vegetable in there. There are pairings that work. And sometimes as authors, our temptation is to just like throw it all in, keep it all in. But that doesn't necessarily make for the best reader experience out the other end. It, may, it might be the most fun author experience because you really get to explore your world, <laughs> but it's not the most fun reader experience. And sometimes as authors, we need outside experts to tell us that what we have done is not going to be the best reader experience. Um, so, and then another way is just to find people you trust. Like I tr like I have, what, six, seven, eight, ten other voices impacting everything I write but I trust them. Um, and that has taken a while. And sometimes I'm really like shaky and nervous because I have like, for, for example, with traditional publishing, sometimes I'll have a new editor all of a sudden. Um, and that is a little shaky because it is sort of this relationship of trust and, and trusting that they don't want to change me too much. Um, and then, and then that's the last part. I mean, this is a very long answer to this question, but um, the last per part is you need to also learn to trust yourself as a writer, like your own voice to know that um, this gut instinct that's saying, no, I know that character is superfluous. Like I know Lord Akeldama has gone off the rails again. I know he's talking about something that doesn't seem relevant to this book. But, and I know it's taking the story away. I know we're losing pace because of it but Lord Akeldama knows more about what's going on than I do. And it might not be necessary for this book, but it's gonna be necessary for a future book. 
So I have to leave it alone. And I have to fight, if I have to fight, with my editor to leave him alone in that scene. And sometimes it's a fight and sometimes the editor doesn't really care. Um, but that's an instinct. Like I've just learned to develop and trust that instinct and it just takes time and working with multiple editors before you get that instinct. Um, so Dick Van Nort wants to know if what is the use of an ARC um, if all the books have been sold in pre-order? Ah, so uh, we're back to talking about fan service. So uh, for those of you who are interested in fan service, which is this special omnibus collection with the, the exclusive little sh short in it, um, the Hedgehog Incident short, um, most it's almost completely sold out. So, uh, Dick, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, I think that Subterranean didn't realize how enthusiastic you guys were. Um, uh, there's also a slight possibility that um, Subterranean could be gunning for, I, I don't think this is likely, but they could be gunning for awards because this is the first time that that short story is in print at all. Um, and so giving this to reviewers and stuff is is a way to get on the a radar for awards um and accolades and that kind of thing so uh it isn't just the sales of the book it's the reputation of the publisher that is in play with some of these kind of more uh small press more elite um books so that that also might be they haven't told me that that's pure speculation but that also might be one of the reasons but i, I really think the um the real reason is they, they just didn't realize they were all gonna sell so quickly um in which case the arc is is a relatively good publicity um vehicle <laughs> annabelle wants me to do a lord akeldama impression i don't have one i'm sorry i'm, I'm really not a great like voice actor Ty has shared a picture of the Prudence arc versus the final Prudence. Um, I actually have them, but I would have to get up and go get them and stuff. But um, so you can check the comment thread and take a look at that photograph if you'd like. Uh, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube or later on in the day, you can bop over to Facebook or do that. Um, or you can um, Google Gail Carriger and cover art. And I have a number of blog posts where I have pictures of the different kinds of cover art, um, including ARCs compared to final um final product. Ah, so Ty is asking how uh, beta and alpha readers fit in. Um, and can they substitute for a developmental edit? Ooh, that is an excellent question. All right. So um, I'm one of the only authors I think who uses the term alpha reader. So don't go out and like use that term as if everybody knew what you were talking about. But beta readers are really common. Um, beta readers, incidentally, the term comes out of beta testing in software, I'm pretty sure. Um, anyway, so uh, for me, an alpha reader uh, comes before I even turn a book into any editor. And that's just because my alpha readers, or mostly one reader now, um, is just so familiar with my, wor my, my style that um, and I'm really just mostly interested in making sure that the humor is correct and that the voice is not tampered with, that it still sounds like a Gale book, essentially. Um, and so that's all I use the alpha reader for. So she just reads it, like gives me some good comments usually, um, and then it goes off to a developmental edit pass. For me, the beta readers come in at that juncture. So sometimes the beta readers are reading at the same time as a copy edit pass is happening. Sometimes I can fit them in um, after the first revision. Um, I specifically use my beta readers. I have four of them right now. Um, my beta readers specifically read for in-world continuity. They're all pulled out of my fan base uh, about six years ago. I pulled them um, and kind of asked them if they would like to do this for me. One of them has beta read for other people as well. I did not know that, but she had. Um, and then the three others, this is a totally new thing for them. Um, and all they do is cross-check continuity. And so what they're looking for is character consistency, things like, does the eye color change? They're also making sure that the ages are correct of the different characters. They consult the wikia a lot. So if you are one of my wonderful, wonderful fans and readers who fills in my wikia, <laughs> Be assured that that is being used. It's used by me. This is my basically my world Bible. Um, it is also used by my beta readers. Um, and they they basically, and, and I have to say they've been invaluable. Almost every single time I have given my beta readers a book 
they have caught a major error of some kind, whether chronological or something else. Um, every single novella, um, if I had just written it without them, there would have been a big error that you guys would have caught. <laughs> like, trust me, you would have caught it, but I didn't. So my beta readers are, are super important to me, uh, but they're basically acting as you guys. My beta readers are the voice of you, my reader base. Um, they are there to uh, catch the things that you guys would catch. <laughs> so do they substitute as a developmental editor? No. Um, I'm a huge advocate of developmental editor. There are authors like at my stage, you know, 10 years and 25 books or whatever it is, who don't use a dev editor when they're publishing, self-publishing. I am not one of those people. I always have a dev editor. And sometimes my dev editor doesn't have a lot of edits for me. Um, for example, The Fifth Gender, which is about to come out, my dev editor had very little for me. But I still happily paid her and I happily took her edits because uh, I want the reassurance of somebody whose eye is specifically trained for story. And it is possible that you may have a critique group or you may have beta readers who are good at developmental edits. But a professional developmental editor, their eye is trained specifically to make sure that your plot, your pace, your story, and your character works cohesively. And that is a skill. That is, that is, a. Uh, that is like being a really good mechanic. Like, I can drive. I'm a pretty decent driver. I'm actually pretty good at parallel parking and stuff like that too. But I cannot like tinker with the functional engine, right? I need a good mechanic. And I feel like a dev editor is kind of like that. Um, so I am, I think you, I think they are different from a beta reader. For me, they're absolutely different from beta readers. Um, the other thing to know about dev editors or editors um, is that they specialize. And so you want an editor who specializes in the genre you're working in. So if you're doing young adult, you want someone who specializes in young adult because they know the voice for that whole genre. If you want sci-fi, same thing. Romance, same thing. Um, so that that's just something to think about when you're thinking about dev editors. And that's because they're going to pay attention and be good at different things. Uh, so uh, a sci-fi editor is going to pay attention to how you're building your world, how your aliens act, how your technology is constructed. Um, a romance editor, dev editor, is going to pay attention to how the tension between your two romantic leads pushes the plot forward, right? Because that's what romance does. So um, you also want to think about pick, audition, and, and like discuss with your dev edit um, where their expertise is. And frankly, a good professional developmental editor is A, in demand, so <laughs> you're going to have to wait a little while for them. B, expensive. Sorry, it just is the way it is. They're going to spend time on it. Um, but C, they will turn you down if they, uh, they think that you're, they will turn me down. They will turn anyone down if their book is not in their wheelhouse. It's not something that they feel like they can edit well. And they should. That's actually the sign of a good developmental editor. If they turn to you and they say, you know what? I only do romance. And this has a bit of a romance in it, but it's really an urban fantasy. And that's not something that I am comfortable editing. So, you know, here are the names of six other editors or something like that. Um... So we talked about alpha beta readers. <laughs> Katie says that letting a book sit is like letting the dough rest. Absolutely. Um, how a book is like making bread. <laughs> Someone needs to write that allegory blog post. <laughs> All right. Oh, hello from London. Hello, London. Yes, I don't have a British accent. I know that's one of the reasons I don't like reading most of my books out loud is like, oh, I don't have a British accent. And I think my books sound better in a British accent. Katie wants to know what I'm reading. Uh, I'm reading, I'm reading, well, I'm reading what I'm drinking. <laughs> uh, I'm drinking a uh, crisp apple angry orchard hard cider. Uh, I'm not really a beer drinker. So I know this looks kind of like a beer bottle, but um, not a big fan of beer. Um, I like a fruity drink. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So cider is kind of a nice afternoon drink. I had a RWA uh, chapter meeting earlier today, and um, so I've had a lot of caffeine. <laughs> so I've, I've decided I needed alcohol instead. Oh, there's there's book asking where I went. <laughs> so so book and some of the people who co who come to these lives regularly know that uh, I only put on makeup when I I've had something else happen this morning. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just lipstick. <laughs> I know, I know. 
Um, but yeah, I had an RWA chapter meeting this morning. That's Romance Writers of America. I'm a pretty active uh, member of my local chapter, so I'm, I'm often going there. Um, all right, I'm scrolling through to see if there are other questions. Oh, Ty wants to ask other questions. Um, yes, I think we're running a little long, but I think that's, I think that's gonna be okay. We're running a bit, we'll go a little bit over an hour. Um, if anybody would like to I, ask other non-publishing questions, um, I think we're ready, we're ready for that. Or if I've missed your question, please ask it again. Um, and <laughs> Angela wants to know where my outfit came from. Um, this is just a little, like, a little top. I actually got it in Germany years ago. It's super nice and light. Um, Ty wants to know how I would cover a poly couple, couple romance. Like, would I do it? Or how would I do it? Who would I write? Um, my inclination it would be to write a pansexual or a bisexual character uh, with interest in both or or at least two genders of some kind. Um, in other words, if you're asking me to write like a like a a menage with or I don't like the word menage. So a poly triad, for example, with all, all gay or all lesbian, that's le I'm less likely to do that. I feel like I would write something that has um, that has a complexity of gender involved in it if I were going to write Polly. Um, and it's not something that I have been avoiding doing or have not been writing. It just, like, hasn't naturally happened for any of my characters yet. Uh, but I'm totally, totally open to it. And for those of you who read the San Andreas books, you know that the, um, the... Kitsune in those books are, are usually Polly. So there's representation, if not, like, if not uh, directly main character. Oh, Ty wants to know how I would actually cover it. As in, the cover of the book? Cover it? <laughs> um, uh, I would probably have a book that had a single uh, character on it. Um, because it would just be really, really hard to get a good uh, photograph that's all that's all three of the characters exactly how I would envision them, I imagine. Unless I had to, do, like, I suppose I could do a photo shoot or something. Uh, that's very expensive. We're getting into expensive territory there. Um, my inclination then would be to just do, that's kind of the way the San Andreas books have just one of the characters on the cover. Uh, that's probably how I would do it. Um, I know the sort of inclination is to, in the romance world, is to put all three characters, like different photographs, photoshopped together. Uh, but that doesn't, to me, the kind of intimacy doesn't come across. It's why they love, like, one of the reasons I love this cover, both of these covers so much, is because I feel like the the connection between the two characters is so significant. Uh, that's why I love those images. And so if I were going to do a cover with three people on it, I would want it to have that level of connection. Uh, and I've never, I've not seen, at least not recently, I've not seen any great photographs of that. Maybe that's what'll happen. Maybe I'll see an awesome pic, like photograph of a triad and I'll be like, I'm gonna write that book. Um, maybe that's how it will happen. Who knows? I have no idea how my creative like brain works. Um, Andrea wants to know which of my books are gonna be released in audiobook format this year. Aha. So um, I always try to mention audiobooks in the Cheer Up newsletter. So if you're not getting the newsletter, get the newsletter because I will, because let me just say that audiobooks are a battle. They're expensive, they're time consuming, and there's a lot of rights crap that goes on with my traditional publisher. It's just a night. Audiobooks are a nightmare, but I know you guys want them and love them. So um, this year, The Omega Objection will be an audiobook. Kurt, who is my narrator, is almost done with that. So expect that announcement soon and yay, finally. Um, I'm hoping this month, maybe, but definitely next month, like fingers crossed. Brian, my producer, assures me that he has all of the assets. He's just going through it all. There's some pickups that need to be done. He's going to put it all together, and then I have to go through the process of uploading it. So then you will get the Omega Objection. So that one is definitely on deck. We have found a narrator for The Fifth Gender. He is supposed to re record it soon. So that one should also come out this year. Now competence to the UK um, and reticence to the UK, I have been told by my publisher that those are going to happen in audio. They have the assets. 
the recordings are done. They are ready to be uploaded. There's just something weird going on with them actually uploading it. And for those of you who are UK audio, you know, there's just been a nightmare with my publisher and audio these days. I don't know what's going on with them. I pretty much have a standard email I send to them once a week now, or I get my agent to send to them, which says, what's going on with the audio UK? You know, you have people who want these books. You have the, you have the <laughs> ability. Um, so I don't know where traditional comes into play. I don't know about audio. If you're asking about the US audio of reticence, that's my next traditional release in August. It usually drops right around the same time. So to answer your question, if you are in the United States this year from Gale <laughs> or GL, you should get the fifth gender, the Omega Objection, and Reticence in audio if you are in the United States. <laughs> Outside of the United States, it gets a little bit more complicated, but I can promise you those three. Now, I also have audio of the short story in fan service. It's already done, it's been recorded, and it's ready to go. But part of my deal, and this is good, not good for you, but it's good for me and it's good for them, is an exclusivity. So Subterranean gets to have the short story, The Hedgehog Incident, aka The Meat Cute. They get to have that for a certain amount of time. And I'm, I will respect that because that's part, they paid me in advance for this book. Like we were all above board with this one. And part of that is they get that, but I do have audio of it. Now it's a short story. It's not very long. <laughs> the audiobook's not long at all. Um, but I will also bring that out for you. Now I can't guarantee you that that will be this year. Um, it's read by Emma. Um, so there's a big, a big break for you guys listening to the live. I haven't talked about this at all. Um, but I do have it. So um, I just need to decide when I want to bring it out and you know, that sort of thing. It's going to kind of ride on how much traveling I'm doing. You know, like I said, audio is a big hassle to do. So um, I have to like clear my schedule. I need to not be writing things. I need to have like, you know, three or four days in a row to kind of battle with the upload process and the, get the cover together and like all that sort of thing. So it's just, it's just kind of a nightmare. Um, but I do have it and it will happen. So it will either happen for Christmas or it will happen like early at the beginning of next year, the audio. And then eventually I will also give you the digital version of that short story. It's just going to take a little bit longer again, partly because of the exclusivity, partly because when I do a digital version, I also have to go hire a cover. I have to get it reformatted. So there's a whole like production process that goes into play for that as well. And just right now I'm, I'm just super busy. <laughs> so, and convention season is about to start. So I'm going to start traveling as well. Um, so with all of these books coming out and being promoted and all that sort of thing, I just, um, I don't really have time to kind of figure it out just yet. Um, so ask me again <laughs> in six months. <laughs> we'll see where we are. Um, Katie wants to know if it's about as long as Curious Case. I think it's a bit longer. So of my short stories, this is the longest short story I've written, which is why we can technically call it a novelette. It is that long. I can sort of see. Um, it's about 10,000 words. Um, so it's longer than Curious Case, I think. I think Curious Case is shorter than that. Maybe marine biology length? Mm. <laughs> uh, but relatively long for me for a short story. Do, do, do. Angela wants to know if I've ever hated any of my characters. No. And part of that is because even the characters that I know my readers really don't like, like Monique or Presha or, or Channing, um, I know why they behave the way they behave. I know their backstory. Um, I, they're usually rather traumatic or broken childhoods or like the reasons that they've become the way they've become. Um, and so I can't really hate them because I understand them. Well, that was a very like, profound statement to make. <laughs> All right. So I think we have time for maybe one last question. And I'm just scrolling through um, to see if I've missed anything significant. But as usual, I'll go back through the threads and make sure to catch any um, additional questions that you guys might have had. Let me see if we, we do a quick summation. For those of you just tuning in, I'm drinking hard cider. Uh, we talked about what the publication journey was like in the traditional publishing vein. If you guys really like that kind of thing, um, 
We can talk about doing other lives that are a little bit more Gail lecturing on, on like the, the book world. Um, I'm actually thinking about maybe doing some lives where I do read for you. I would probably read for you stuff that's not Parasol verse, that's not a British accent. <laughs> uh, maybe, you know, just a little first chapter or something. Um, what else have we talked about? We talked about the arc process. We talked a little bit about what's going on with fan service. Um, and Andrea had one final question for us, which is, will I ever do backstory for Professor Lyle? Maybe. Um, it certainly would be fun to do. I think if we have any significant Professor Lyle backstory, it will be because I am writing Alessandro's story, which is something that I would eventually like to do, but is just kind of on the long list of of things that I'm thinking affectionately about maybe writing in the future. Um, and then Melinda has one final question, which is what happens at a typical RWA meeting? Um, for a chapter meeting, it's just we all gather together and gossip about the industry, and then we get kind of bored, like bored as in the board of RWA notes on what's going on, and then we get presentations from different board members. And, uh, and then we get a lecture on something very interesting. Uh, today's lecture was on foreign translations, which blew my tiny mind. <laughs> um, I learned so much. Uh, yeah, uh, you should see me freaking out on Twitter about German um, titles. I have always disliked my German titles. I have not been... Uh, uh, like, missish about this. I have stated publicly how annoyed I was with my German titles. And it turns out, this is mind-blowing, you guys. It might not be for you, but it was for me. Um, and nobody told me this. Ten years I have lived in ignorance. It turns out that German titles are copyrighted. So you can't use the same title. So if the title is already being used in Germany under German translation, you can't use it. And I can guarantee you that's what happened to Solus. Someone else had that title. So they have to come up with not just a new title, a new title that isn't being used already. This is mind blowing to me. Um, there's a reason, obviously, why titles can't be copyrighted in the United States. Huh? Um, so yeah, uh, such a simple explanation. Nobody thought to tell me when I was freaking out and getting really upset about my German titles that the reason that they hadn't given me soulless as a title in German was because they couldn't because <laughs> they're legally not allowed to um yeah totally blew my mind anyway so that's the kind of thing that I learned at RWA um it's great uh, I really love I, I urge you if you have a vibrant local RWA chapter to consider if you're and you're a writer to consider joining it whether you write romance or not uh, because the thing about romance writers is they're very like forward thinking in terms of technology and experimentation and new they've had to be because it's a very suppressed and like kind of shameful genre um where people really like look down on it and and yet it's the most popular fiction genre in the world and uh and so romance has has kind of had to survive by being very scrappy um and so it's a lot of mostly powerful business-minded women in publishing getting together to talk about the industry and so you know rwa has been great for me i really love them um but it really depends on your local chapter it's really sort of chapter specific um angela wants to know what would happen if in germany they left the title in english i don't know um <laughs> good question um i did think well um my inclination would be to sort of name the the books the like title the titular character name especially if it's a weird one which all of mine have so like Solus would have been um the adventures of Alexia Terabody book one or something like that um that would have been the way I would go then under those circumstances but I'm not translating my stuff into German so I don't <laughs> I don't I don't have to really think about those things but yeah big revelation for me Anyway, this life has gone very long. I really appreciate all of you uh, hanging around and uh, listening to me gab. Uh, let me know in the comments or just on the Facebook page if there are other topics you'd like me to cover in depth that you're really sort of curious about or interested in. Um, I know I did a little bit in the last live on cover art and now you've gotten the publication process. So like maybe I could do um, what the independent book birthing publication process is like when I self publish a book. Um, but anything uh, you guys are um, 
interested in or would like a more in-depth coverage on, let me know. I'd be delighted to do it. Um, I do feel like like some of this can be a good blog post, but um, sometimes it's just better to talk with visual aids. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. I'm gonna sign off, finish my cider. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. And the next live is going to be on May 18th, which is the fifth gender's birthday. So we will have a little launch party live. And I very much look forward to talking to all of you then. Bye.